All right, I think we're going to get started now. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Go On webinar series. My name is Michael Aquafreda, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program, and I'll be moderating today's session. This webinar will be an interactive experience. So to participate, please go to kahoot.it and type in the pin 2051639. This webinar is sponsored by four organizations. First, Go On, the Global Ocean, Ocean Acidification Observing Network. Second, NOAA, the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Third, the IAEA, OAICC, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. And last, but certainly not least, the IOC UNESCO the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. For those of you who are new to GOON, it is a collaborative international network designed to detect and understand the drivers of ocean acidification and the resulting impacts on marine ecosystems. GOON serves as a platform for acquiring and exchanging data and knowledge necessary to optimize models. GOON also provides key inputs to communities, industries, governments, global organizations, and other stakeholders who are developing action plans, best practices, mitigation and adaptation strategies in order to address ocean acidification's impacts. GOON is a large organization with over 800 members from over 105 countries. We are really glad today to have over 130 participants, and we welcome any of those participants who are not currently GOON members to join our network. You could do so by going to goon.org. During the presentation, all participants are in listen-only mode. You are welcome to type any questions you have into the questions box, which can be found on the bottom right-hand side of your control panel. We do ask that uh, you specify um, if you're directing your questions to Sam or one of his co-authors. We'll be monitoring incoming questions and pose them to our speaker at the very end of today's session. We also encourage you to pose your questions and share your insights on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange and also on Twitter using the hashtag GoOnWS, Go on webinar series. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Go On YouTube channel uh, in a few hours after the presentation ends. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Oops, <laughs> Dr. Sam Dupont, who is a senior lecturer and associate professor at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. His main research topic is on the effect of global changes, such as ocean acidification and warming on marine ecosystems. He is a member of the Executive Council of GOON and serves on the advisory board for the Ocean Acidification International Coordination Committee. Sam's co-authors on this work include Dr. Christina McGraw and Dr. Chris, Dr. Christopher Cornwall. Dr. McGraw is a senior lecturer at the University of Otago in New Zealand, and Dr. Cornwall is a research fellow and lecturer at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand as well. So with no further ado, I will now pass it over to Sam. Um, Sam, I'm going to make you the presenter. And you should be able to take away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody. So it's nice to see so many of you for this for this presentation that show that there is a, a real interest in, in how we should address multiple stressors. So, so the idea of this talk really started with uh, a SCORE working group led by Philip Boyd. Uh, and over the last years, we really discussed uh, how, how we should study multiple stressors and, uh, and what's happening. Sorry about that. Uh, do you still see my... We still see your PowerPoint presentation. Because I don't, <laughs> which can be a little bit challenging. Uh, let's see how I can fix this. Sorry about that, guys. Um, that's interesting because I see, yeah, I'm back on it. So it's the Kahoot now? Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, so basically that, that originated from the working group and we tried to develop best practices and so on. And, and for now on, we said like, okay, how can we communicate some of the message in a different way? And we thought that making an interactive presentation like this one could be actually interesting. So uh, 
again, it's going to be an interactive presentation, so you will have the chance to actually answer a few questions. And it's, of course, it's not an exam, it's just so you can uh, have a, a we can actually see a little bit uh, uh, what you know uh, or what you think you know uh, about multiple stressors and orient a little bit the discussion accordingly. So go to, to kahoot.it uh, and the code is 2051639. And I will keep the, the, the link and the code on, on every slide just in case. Uh, so I will start with the take home message and the take home message is really that, you know, oh, it, it's I can, only see a, I can only see you, I can't see anything. I can't see oh. your slides. Can you double check, okay. please? Yeah, because I, I have this. Okay, so Mike, can you tell us if you see my slides? Uh, I also cannot see your slides right now. Uh, it's What about this now? This works. Yep, now we see okay. your slides. Sorry about screen. that. Perfect, thank Interesting. you. No problem. Uh, thank you. So, so let's go. Let's start with the take-home message. Because uh, for, first, basically, what I what we want to convene is that it's not possible to understand how multiple stressor works with just a simple multiple stressor experiment. It's much more complicated than that, and we will try to go through different concepts to to justify this. So overall, what we want to, 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 to convince you is that if you want to study multiple stressors, if you want to be able to understand what's going to happen in this complex array of stressors in the future, you need a strategy that will combine different approaches from simple single stressor mechanistic studies to defined performance curve. You would have to do some modeling, some monitoring, some statistics, and in a way, multiple stressors experiments is really what you do at the very end. All right, so the, the context, of course, is that we are all interested in ocean acidification. That's probably one of the reasons why we are part of Gohan and so on. But acidification is only one of the many pressure that we are putting on, on the marine ecosystem. So we have on one side global changes like warming, acidification, hypoxia, and so on and so on. And that on top of all the other uh, changes that are happening at the local scale. And that includes, you know, habitat destruction, overexploitation of resources. There's a lot of noise on social media about overfishing now, uh, local pollution, including plastics and like species introduction and so on. And basically the, the real question is that, how can we address all these things at the same time? And, and it's complicated because not only it's a lot of stressors, but the, the intensity, the pressure of these stressors is different in different places. So if you go on the tropic or in the polar region or in temperate regions, you're going to have different combination of these stressors. And I just put like a map of what is expected as changes for sea level rise, temperature and pH. And you can see that it's not uniform around the world. So if we want to develop solutions, we need to understand locally what are the different combination of stressors so we can actually develop solutions that are useful and, and efficient. And to do that, you need to identify priorities. And to identify a priority of stressors, you need to think about two things. One is exposure. So exposure will be like how stressful is it, or how, how, how much acidification do you have, how much warming do you have, how much chemical pollution do you have at a specific location. And to do that, to understand this, this exposure, you basically need to monitor. So that's why networks like Goan are so important because the first thing you really want to do is really understand the, what kind of stressors you have out there in the ecosystem or the region where you work and, and, and how intense are these exposures, like a little bit of change of temperature or a massive change. And these, of course, will have a consequence on what you should prioritize for your stressors and your solutions. So exposure is the first side. And the second side is the effects, and the effects will depend on the biology. So you could have the same temperature increase in two different regions, but the effect on the ecosystem will be much stronger in one than the other because they are adapted to different conditions, for example. So some are more sensitive to change than others. So if you want to resolve this other side, uh, for that you need to do basically biological experiments. So you need the biology. So you need both the monitoring and the biology, and by combining these two approaches, what you can do is define a priority list of stressors. And then when you know, okay, the main stressor in my area is this. So what I have to do is that I need to basically uh, manage the, the emission of that pollutant or it's a global problem. So we need to, to, to work toward policies and so on. So basically you need to identify your list of stressors. 
The problem is that you have this array of different stressors, A, B, C, D, whatever, and, and when you want to understand the combined effect, it's even more complicated because this is not just a simple mathematical addition. You can have more complicated effect and we will go through this because these combinations, these effects are not linear and they are not just a mathematical addition. And if you want to design an experiment that is relevant for your region, including all the important drivers, that would lead to something completely unrealistic. You're going to have far too many stressors, far too many scenarios, so it would be very complicated to perform. And even if you were able to do that, that would be very complex to interpret if you just have multiple stressors experiments. So now we're going to have two parts in the presentation, uh, and we're going to go a little bit deeper into concepts. And the first part will be about definitions. And it's really important to define the terminology you use in the right way, not only because it's the proper way of using the words, but also because there are some concepts behind it that we really need to understand. And, 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 uh, and the reason why we thought it was important to have that part is because when you review the literature, if you, if you review some, some manuscript, you will realize that people use a lot of terms in the wrong way, and that can lead to a lot of confusion. So let, let's imagine first the first case study that will lead to the first questions. So let's say you're interested in what will be the impact of ocean acidification on mussels that are located in this beautiful Chengxi Island in China. So if you go there and collect your mussels, uh, you, you can also monitor the pH and you can realize that the pH variability uh, in that area is between 8.2 and 7.6 all year round. So then you design an experiment and you test the effect of two pH. So one is 8.2 and the other one is 7.8 under the idea that you expect a 0.4 pH decrease under IPCC scenario. So you decrease 8.2 by 0.4 and you have a pH of 7.8. So you have these, you basically collect their muscles, expose them to conditions, and then you follow growth after a certain period of time. And what you see is on this graph here where you have a significant decrease of 15% in growth. So the first question I will ask you for that experiment, can we conclude from these data that muscle growth decreases by 15% under ocean acidification? So we're gonna go on the Kahoot now. So go back to your tablet, phone or computer and I'm gonna start and you're gonna have one minute to answer the question. All right, so first question soon. Here we go. So. Yes or no? Can can you conclude that there's a decrease of 15%? Sorry, I forgot to change under ocean acidification. This is kind of stressing. I want to know if this is going to work. If this is going to work. All right, 92 answers. This is not bad. Ninety-seven. Five, four, three, two, and one. So let's see the results. So 30% said yes, 68% said no. All right. Um, so we're gonna go now to the next question, I think, uh, here. So the next question is that, can you conclude that from the results of this experiment that muscles are stressed when exposed to the lower pH of 7.8? So let's go to the next question, here we go. Right, I guess I can go. So most people said yes. And then the last question for this is, can you conclude that the results show that pH is a stressor for these muscles? 
करता हूं This is fun. <laughs> All right, 114 answers. So it's a little bit of a mix again with more people saying yes than no. So it's 549 no. So thank you. So we'll come back to Kawit later so we can continue the presentation now. All right. So if we want, uh, the reason why we ask this question is because we use different, different terminology. So I use stressors and stress, for example. So a stressor, if you want a real definition, is something that that drive a quantifiable negative effect on an organism. So, for example, a really negative effect on fitness or, or really dramatic changes in metabolisms and stuff like that, where a driver, it's a more general concept that it's a pressure that causes a quantifiable change, but it could be positive or it could be negative. And the stress is also a very specific physiological response that you're going to see when you're exposed to a stressor. So a driver could be temperature, for example. Temperature could be a driver. It will always kind of lead to physiological changes. But stressor is when you have extreme temperatures that will lead to negative effects. Or if you want to use my favorite example, you can use alcohol as, as a stressor for humans. If you use it at a small dose, like a little glass of wine every day, it's, it's been shown that it actually can have a positive effect. It actually can increase longevity and so on. But if you use it on a high, high dose, like a higher dose, like a lot of wine in one evening, like an acute stress, uh, that is going to create like a physiological stress and you're going to be hangover the day after and you feel terrible. And if you do that every day, it's a chronic exposure. So that leads to death. Uh, and that's basically the same for any kind of driver. So all the things we consider when we talk about multiple stressors are first a driver, something that is naturally present for many of those, like temperature, salinity, pH, oxygen. And that, that vary, of course, and that's a driver that's linked, that's, that's uh, driving some kind of physiological response. But then when you reach certain boundaries, it leads to a stress, like a specific negative physiological response, and then uh, it can be considered as a stressor. And, and you could see that also, for example, for acidification. So that's an experiment we've done many years ago where we tested a wide range of pH. And what we could see is that if you expose a serotonin larvae for slowly decreasing pH, what's happening is they, they grow a little bit slower. So the, 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 the growth rate goes slower, slower and slower, but without having a significant negative effect on their fitness. So it's basically plasticity. So they, they, they grow slower because they have access to a little bit less energy, but without compromising their fitness. But then that works only when you are within the natural range of variability. And when you cross a certain line, what we call a physiological tipping point, then you start to have very negative effects. So the growth goes down, but they also turn up normal, they start dying and they can't produce their juvenile. So that's a good example showing that when you're within the natural range of variability, pH is not a stressor, it's a driver and you have plasticity. And if you cross that line of the natural variability, then you start to have very negative effect and what was a driver turned into a stressor. And, and, in, and for our case study, that's the same story. So I told you that the variability was between 8.1 and 7.7 .7 in the area. So what's happening is that in the future, you're going to have a shift of this range. So it's going to go down. And so basically, they're going to be exposed to lower pH. But the two scenarios that have been tested, like 8.2 and 7.8, are still within the natural range of variability. So in that case, that means that the two pHs are not really stressors, they are very likely drivers. And the effect you see is not a response to stress, but rather a response to variability. So the answer to the three question was no. You have a decrease by 25% under ocean acidification, but it's not acidification because it's still within the natural range of variability. So it's a response to low pH, but not relevant in the context of acidification. Muscles, this question, no, it's no. The two is no because uh, they are not stressed. They are response, responding to plasticity. And the last question, we can't really consider pH as a stressor based on, those based on those data because basically we are still within the natural range again. All right, so I have one more question uh, uh, based on, uh, to, to, to test a little bit your, your, your knowledge on, on, on the, this terminology. So 
is this sentence correct? So if we combine two stressors, is this always leading to more stress than the individual effect of each stressor? So let's go back to Kahoot here and here we go. So does combining two stressors always lead to more stress than if you have one stressor at a time? So the answers are yes, no, or it depends. Okay, 96, 97, 100 Braves one answering the questions. Thank you for that, that's nice. All right, so the answer was it depends for most people, like only four answered yes and 33 answered no. So what is the right answer then? So by definition, a stressor is only driving negative effect. So if you combine two stressors, it always will lead to more negative effect. There is no way that if you combine two stressors, it's going to mitigate each other, like you can see with drivers. So if you combine two drivers, you can have response in all the directions. But if you are at the level of being a stressor where you deviate from this natural variability, it's always negative. So it, it, that, the answer would have been, it depends if the two stress, if I would say like two drivers, but if I say stressors, the answer is always yes. All right, so the part, that's the end of the part one. And, and so basically uh, what was the point of all that is basically that it's important to use the right terminology, but also the underlying concept. And you can see in a lot of paper that you will review and so on, that people are, all, are very, very often, probably more than 50% of the case, selecting their scenario under the assumption that you have a control which is the high pH and you have a low pH that is around 7.7, 7.6 and the justification is that that's IPCC scenarios but this is only true for open ocean of course and, 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 in, and, and on the coast like in the example I showed you this is not a realistic way of thinking because you need to take into account the present variability so the first thing you need to do is you go and measure the pH variability at the sites of your choice, like where you want to study a certain ecosystem or a certain species, and measure how much variability they are experiencing today, and that all of these values are your controls. So if you check the little graph here, this is what you have in the fjord where I work, and naturally all year round the pH vary between 8.6 and 7.6, so all of these are present scenarios. And what actually is deviating or shifting of all this natural range will be future. So when I do experiment here, I always use three different scenarios. I use a high pH, like 8.1, which is a present average pH. I use 7.6, which is also a control in a way, is the extreme of today. And that's also corresponding to a, the, the average of the future. So it's also relevant in the context of acidification. And then I use a scenario of 7.4, which is deviating from present natural variability and is the extreme of the future. So in that case, I have two pH 8.1 and 7.6 where I can expect some plasticity, so not really a stress, but a driver, and then the lower pH where it's going to be for sure really stressing for the organism. All right, so now let's go into other concepts for the part two that is a little bit more complicated. For the part two, we're going to talk about concepts that are also classically used in the literature like additive effects, synergism, synergistic, antagonistic, and so on. And I will try to show you that these things are used also very wrongly most of the time. So let's go into another case study. So we are done with muscles, now we're going to work with, with sea urchins. So this is an experiment that we've done several years, several years ago where we tested two stressors. So one was acidification and the other one was oil. So we simulated an oil spill and we checked what was the impact on sea urchin larvae. And what we saw was really interesting is that if you expose the, the sea urchin larvae to low pH, you have a minus 77% uh, decrease in growth rate. If you expose them to oil, you have a 11% decrease in growth rate, and if you combine both, you have an 18%, which was quite fascinating because it's a pure addition. Like you basically, seven plus eight, 11 give you 18%. So in that case, we had like stressor one plus stressor B equal A plus B. So my question for you is like, from this experiment, we saw that the effect of the oil and acidification combined was equal to the effect of the oil plus the effect of OA. So can we conclude from that, that 
oil and acidification are additive environmental parameters? And the, the, the options are yes, no, or it's not possible to know from that experiment. So let's go back on the Kahoot. And next. All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you. So the answer is like majority of yes, only a few no, and uh, 32 I don't know. So, so let's go back to the presentation. And before I answer, let's go through a few concepts. So if you check in the literature, the definition of additivity or synergism and all these things, this is often what you have is that if you have a certain effect from stressor A, a certain effect from stressor B, if you just add these two, you have an additive effect, which is exactly the example I showed you with oil. So under that definition, the, the correct answer would be yes. But you will see that the question was not about additivity of effect, but additivity of stressors, which are two completely different things. So. But before I go into more detail, let, let's have a, a third case study, and then I'll go back to the first to the case study two, and, and, and I'll show you what, what's the thing. But uh, in, in the previous studies, we had two stressors. We had oil and we had uh, acidification. If we decided to, to make a funny theoretical experiment where we actually have two stressors, which would be temperature and temperature, in that silly case, you can expect temperature and temperature to have additive effect, of course. That makes sense because it's the same stressor. So if you just increase the intensity of one stressor, it should, it should add to each other. So that's the definition of an additivity effect. So in, in that case, let's imagine an experiment where we test the impact of temperature on muscles. So we have a control, we measure the growth, we increase the temperature by two degrees, we have an effect plus 10%, then we increase by four degrees, you have 15%. And then in that case, the question is like, what would be the combined effect of these two stressors, which is the same drivers, it's temperature. So what if we have six degrees, what would be the impact on growth? And uh, I remember temperature and temperature, it's an additive effect. So in that case, the question is like, if we combine these two drivers, two degrees plus four degrees equals six degrees, what will be the impact? Will you have a 35% decrease, would you have less than 35 decrease, more than 35% decrease, or it depends. And one more time, I think there are two more questions and then we will be good. So 35, less than 35, more than 35, or it depends. I'm really curious about that one. All right, thank you very much. So most of the answers were, it depends. So for the rest, it was quite well distributed. Thank you. And here we go. So the answer for that one is actually, it depends. Actually, it depends on, on one thing, is that the shape of the performance curve. So it would be additive mathematically. So the answer would be 35 if the relationship between temperature and the growth in that case would be purely linear. But in practice, the, the performance curve are more or less never linear. What's happening is that if you increase the intensity of a stressor like temperature, first you're gonna have a positive effect here for temperature. So basically you increase the metabolism. So that's gonna increase the growth you reach a physiological tipping point and then you go into negative effect, which could lead to metabolic depression, decreased growth and eventually mortality. So because these performance curves are more or less never linear, even if you have only one stressor like temperature and you have an additive effect, of course, because you just add temperature to temperature, that doesn't mean that you're gonna have an additive uh, 
uh, results on the effect. So this is the drivers and this is the effect. And what we see during experiments is, is only the effects and we don't really understand what's happening at the driver effects. So just to illustrate this, how it can happen. So let's say that in your exper in the experiment I just showed you, we, we would be here. So if we were like low on the performance curve and you increase the temperature by two degrees, you have a certain effect. You increase the temperature by four degrees, you have a certain effect. And then you increase the temperature by six degrees. And in that case, because we are on the linear phase of that growth, you have a purely additive effect. So in that case, you're going to see A plus B equal A plus B here. So effect of A plus effect of B equal effect of A plus B. So that's exactly what we saw with the oil and temperature too. But it could be that your, that your reference temperature is a bit higher on that performance curve. And then if you increase by two degrees, you have a positive effect. If you increase by four degrees, you also have a little bit of a positive effect. And then if you combine both, you move to the other side of the curve and then you go down and then you're going to have what is often called an antagonistic effect. So remember, it's still an additive drivers, it's the additive effect of the temperature, but the, what you see at the effect is antagonistic. And then you can have the case like this, where you're much higher on the curve. If you, ex you increase by two degrees, you have an effect. If you increase by four degrees, you have another effect. And then if you combine, you have another effect. And actually in that case, the effect is even worse than the mathematical addition of the effect. So in that case, we have what is called a synergistic effect where it's more than the mathematical addition. But the point from this CD example where we combine temperature with temperature is that temperature is additive with temperature. So at the level of the, of the drivers, we have two additive drivers. But at the effect size, it depends. It depends where you are on the curve. It depends on the shape of the curve. So at the effect level, you're going to see something that is synergistic, antagonistic, or additive, depending on where you are on the curve to start with. So that shows you that if you just do a, a multi-stressor experiment or sometimes even a single stressor experiment, you can't infer anything on the additivity of the drivers just based on what you see at the effect. You can see the synergistic effect and it's still additive driver. Okay, so, and that's because additive drivers work in a non-linear way because the shape of the curve is very rarely linear. So what that doesn't translate into arithmetic mathematical addition at the effect level. And so what you see at the effect level does not tell you anything about how the drivers or the stressor are actually working together. You can't tell from this if it's additive, synergistic or something else. So basically if there is an interaction or not. So that shows that if you just do a simple multi-stressor experiment, you have a very limited potential to understand how the, the stressors works together. So you need to do something more than that, okay? So that's also explained why the answer of, uh, of the question five was, it's not possible to know because from what we see as a result from this experiment, which is an additive effect, uh, an additive response at the effect level, that doesn't mean that oil and acidification are working additively or not. Actually, they are not. Oil and acidification have completely different mode of action, so they are not additive at all. They work in a completely different way. All right, so basically the message here is that if you want to understand how two stressor works, doing a simple multiple stressor experiment won't tell you anything because what you see at the stressor, at the effect level, doesn't necessarily transfer into the driver level. And what you need really to do is understand the mode of action. So you need to spend some time doing some mechanistic studies to understand what's happening inside my organism or my ecosystem, why I expose them to pH, to temperature, salinity, because if you understand the mechanisms, then you can start to imagine how they will work in combination. Let's go back to my silly alcohol example. If you have two stressors that would be beers and wine, they have the same mode of action. So both of them are different things, but they will, if you drink them, they will lead to an increase of ethanol in your blood. And that's what actually is driving the physiological response you have. So in that case, two different drivers, they have the same mode of action. So in that case, you can expect to have an additive effect. If you combine wine with another drug stressor that could be a medication that you're taking or drugs, in that case, they're going to have very different mode of action. So wine will increase ethanol and the drugs will specifically target, for example, a, a neurotransmitter or something like that. And then you can expect to have more complex interactions between these two things. So it's not going to be a simple additive 
uh, response at the driver level. So that's why if you define a strategy and you're really serious about understanding how drivers will work in combination, you really have to work first at a single driver level and try to understand what's happening inside of your organism. And if you want to define these terms that I presented at the beginning, basically additive doesn't mean that you have an addition of effect, but that means that you don't have interactions between the driver. So they have similar mode of action, like the, the beer and the wine, where when you use synergistic or synergism and antagonistic, basically what it means is that they have different mode of action and you can expect to have some interactions between the drivers. So something else will happen because the two stressors are actually acting on different things within your organism or your ecosystem. So you end up with four different options. You can have stressors that either have the same or different mode of action and that can have interactions or no. If you're in the case where you don't have interaction, then that's what you would call additive. And if there is, uh, or you can have interactions. All right, so you have to understand the mode of action and then try to understand if they have interactions or no interaction. So to put that into a little bit of practice, I have one thing, it's the last question for you guys. Uh, we're gonna talk now about the impact of two different drivers or stressors, climate change linked to ocean warming, so increase in temperature and overfishing. And the question is like, what will be the impact on fish stock? And we have information saying that global warming will kill 50% of the fish and that fishing will kill also 50% of the fish. And because you can really understand that these are completely different drivers or stressors, like they will act on completely different things. Like one is killing by removing the fish and the other one has negative effect on physiology. We can predict that these two guys will be, will have no interaction whatsoever. So the question is that what's gonna happen when you combine global warming and fishing pressure that both remove 50% of the fish? At the end, will you have 25% of all the fish that will die, 33%, 75% of all the fish will die. So let's go back to Kahoot and let's try this. So two stressors that are not interacting and have both an effect of 50% mortality. So what's the, con the consequence when you combine them? Does that lead to 25% of all the fish dying, 75%, 33% or 100% of all the fish dying? All right, takes a little bit more time for that one. Doing mathematics, I guess, in your head. Okay. So most of the people answer 75%, and uh, we have a little bit of distribution for the other one. So what's the answer? So basically you're in a case where you have two stressors with completely different mode of action, and, uh, and, uh, and they have no interaction whatsoever. So in that case is the simplest way of calculating what's gonna be the combined effect because they are really not interacting at all in any way. So you have stressor one that will remove 50% of the fish, which is overfishing. And then you're gonna have the second driver that's gonna remove the remaining, like 50% of the remaining, remaining fish, which means at the end you have to consider the effect of individual drivers, but also consider the interaction. So the right answer, and you were most of you were correct, is 75 percent so that's that's the easier scenario so that's making actually your life much easier you have additive stressors uh in that case so they work in additive matter with no interaction but we can see actually what would be considered an antagonistic effect so again if you just look at the effect size you can't really predict how the stressors are working but then you can have other case studies like where you have uh, same mode of action so instead of different and no interaction, and a good example of that would be ocean acidification and temperature. So in that case, if you're interested, you can have a look at that paper where, where basically what you're gonna have as the, as the combined effect will just depend on the combination. So if when we tested this, we had low temperature and for an acidification scenario, we had actually a positive effect of acidification. We did the same experiment with a higher temperature and we had no effect of OA. And then when we uh, did that at high temperature, we had a negative. So we had positive, no effect or negative effect 
under the same acidification scenario depending on the temperature. And you can explain that again with the same uh, performance curve that I, I showed you before with temperature plus temperature. That's the same philosophy, except that here we have two drivers that work in an additive manner and then move along this performance curve. Then one last example would be a case where you have two stressors with different mode of action and where you can expect interaction. And for that case studies, it could be, for example, acidification and a toxicant. And we did an experiment just as an example. You have many more in the literature where we combine acidification and a stressor called triclosan. So what we showed is that if you, dec if you decrease the pH, you have a decrease in growth rates in these guys, in brittle stars, after four weeks. If you expose them to triclosan, you also have like about 35% decrease in growth rate. But when you combine them, it was a massive negative effect and they were all dying. So it was not just a small decrease in growth. And that's because triclosan and pH work on completely different things. So they have this, this uh, different mode of action. And also you can have very complex interactions. So pH will modify the way triclosan is perceived uh, inside the organism, but also will change the toxicity of the triclosan in the water. So because it's, uh, it, it has a pKa that is uh, um, really within the, net, the, the range of acidification. So that means just by changing the pH, you make triclosan more toxic, more toxic. So you have complex interactions. So if you really want to predict what would be the combination of these two drivers, you really need to dig more into mechanistic understanding and go and understand how both triclosan and pH works and how they can uh, work in combination. So the take-home message here, again, it's really not possible to understand combined effects of multiple stressors from one experiment. And the reason, again, is because what you see at the effect size is not telling you much about what you see at the stressor side. And what you really need to understand is what's happening at the stressor side, because that's what you need to parameterize models and, and make some forecasting and projections. And, and so basically, if you want to really understand what's happening for your multiple stressors, you need a strategy. What you need is combine different approach. So you need to understand what's happening inside your organism. So do, you can do genetic, you can do physiology, you can do performance. There's a lot of stuff you can do. A second thing you need to understand is the shape of the performance curve, because these things are never linear. And that's really critical if you want to understand this. Then you can put all this information into models. And because if you understand, okay, I have five different stressors, I know how they work, I understand that they will, I expect them to have this kind of interaction. So this is what I can expect when they are working together. And then it's great because you can forecast with a wide range of different conditions. What if temperature increased by two degrees, pH decreased by 0 0.3 pH unit, food concentration changed by this and by that. But then all models are wrong one way or another. So it's very important if you want to validate your, your, your models to actually do at that stage multiple stressors experiments. So first, you, I think that's kind of the strategy we, we recommend is first, wherever you are, you make a list of what you think are all the important drivers and stressors. So for that, it's monitoring exercise. You go put pH probes, temperature probes, and you measure at, at high resolution. You need the weather, you need like the, the, sh the short-term changes. What are the concentration of the major toxicants there? For example, heavy metals, could be anything, plastic if you think it's important. You check, you check basically all your drivers and all your stressors. Two, you spend some time understanding what all these drivers are doing within your organism or your ecosystem. And you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of information already available out there. So we know a lot about what pH does at the physiological level or the ecological level more and more. What temperature is really done, is doing is really well documented. What oxygen is doing is also well documented. Overfishing is well documented. So you have already all this information that you can use. Then you just identify the gaps. Okay, we know very little about that. So that's why I'm going to invest my energy on. And I'm going to understand the mode of action so I can predict what kind of interactions I really have. Is it additive or is there interaction? And I, again, you can't tell that by just checking as a simple thing. So when, when you arrive at that stage where you actually you, you list your different drivers, you do some monitoring, you understand your mode of action, you also try to, to measure the performance curve, so a, a longer a gradient of temperature, pH, salinity, and so on. You see what is the shape of the performance curve. 
So all that needs to be done using single stressor experiments. And finally, you put all this information together, so combining the monitoring and all the mechanistic understanding you have, you build models, and then you can actually test your models using multi-stressor experiments. So it's really exciting when you do these things using that strategy, because if you start by doing a multi-stressor experiment, at the end of the day, it's more or less impossible to interpret. Uh, and that's okay. I think if, you, if you've done it, that's fine. I think you can still come back to these results later, but it's really important that you do these two other extra steps, like understand the monitoring, do your biology right, and do your modeling. So that was more or less what I wanted to tell you, and thanks again for, for answering the, 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 the question. I, I will send, send the report so we can put it also on the website of Goan, so we can have an ID. Actually, uh, I can tell you that you did much better than the two other group I tried before. So I tried that with, uh, in a course, and I tried that in a conference, and, and you had a higher level of good answers than, than they did, so it's, it's, it's really nice. Uh, if you want to design such multi-stressor experiments, uh, there are a lot of really nice resources that have been developed by the SCORE Working Group. So there is a website, there are some scientific publications. This is a really good reference paper if you're interested in, in, in these aspects with good definitions and so on. But you also have teaching resources and material that can help you to, to guide your thinking. So going through a little bit of what I just discussed, like how you make a stressor inventory, how you do your research, how you basically design properly your experiments and so on. So this is, all that is very interesting. So please go on the, the website of the SCORE Working Group 149 on multiple stressors. And I think that's it for me. So thanks again all for, for uh, your participation and now let's start the discussion. Thank you so much, Sam. That was a really great webinar. Uh, we have quite a few questions that came in. Um, so I will take back control of the PowerPoint. Okay. So if anyone has questions, you could please type them into the questions box. And you could also post questions on Twitter using the hashtag GoOnWS, at GoOn. And if there's any questions that we don't get to today, we're going to post them on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange, where um, Sam and also his co-authors will um, do their best to answer your questions. So let me pull out the questions now, and we'll answer some of those. Try at least, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is, what is the best way to identify what the main stressor is in a multi-stressor experiment? Sometimes this may be straightforward, sometimes not. Uh, so so I, I, I think if, if, if you do it in, uh, in a multi-stressor experiment, it depends a little bit on, on what you are measuring some of the endpoints you, that you can select uh, are really far from fitness uh, and then it's really hard to actually identify the stressors because an increase uh, in metabolism does not necessarily translate into positive or negative, negative effect or a short decrease. So, so sometimes it's really hard or the difference in gene expression is a good example of things that are really hard to interpret. But if you want to do that in the right way, I think if, if, you really, if your question is really what are the main drivers, uh, th then go for something that relates to fitness, something like as, as brutal as mortality, for example. Like a, mortality is very easy to interpret, it's, it's negative point. So then you can see which driver is actually inducing the highest level of mortality. So in that case, it's, I think then that would be my answer. Try, try to, to use uh, endpoints that are closely related to the fitness as close as possible with mortality being one of the biggest one or reproduction can be also a very important one. And this is kind of a related question. It's how do you determine whether an environmental parameter is a stressor versus a plastic response? That's a really good one. I didn't have the time to go into too much details. I think what stressors, as I said, will drive specific physiological response if you're interested at a response at the organism level. So there are some markers, for example, that you can you can measure, and that will be indicator of stress. So that's that's 
that's one way. Uh, I would say that's probably the easiest way. Uh, but the, then I guess uh, the way I like to, the, let's imagine that you do an experiment and you test two scenarios and you'd have one, one high pH, one low pH, and then you see an effect like let's say a decrease in growth. In that case, it's very hard to know if it's plastic or if it's a stress because a small decrease could be plastic or could be a response to stress. So that's why I prefer experiment where you have a range of, of, of conditions and then you can most of the time really see this breaking point where you decrease and you have this, this mild negative effect and then you have a breaking point and you pass to the dark side and you have strong negative effect. And in that case, you can really see it's, it's, it's really a stressor. And stressor will drive response, I guess, on fitness-related parameters. So it's going to start to induce abnormality, asymmetry, mortality, you know. Uh, so really strong negative effects. So it's, it's again, the, the answer is like check the right endpoint and, and try to, to check on, on gradient so you can really see uh, when you deviate from, from just like a mild effect to a really negative effect. But something I didn't have the time to say too much is that I said like you have to take into account the natural variability to define your 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 your, your scenarios. And most of the time what you see is that when you deviate from the present natural variability, you induce stress. But it's not always as easy as that because it depends uh, on how well adapted are your organism to their environment. In some cases, they will be very well adapted and you're going to have a link between how much they can tolerate before being stressed and the natural variability they have today. In other cases, that might not be the case. And that means that they might be stressed already within the natural range or they might actually not be stressed when you deviate from the present natural variability. So that, that's, I overgeneralize a little bit, but it's still a good advice that if you want to design a proper experiment try to take into account the natural viability that they are experiencing today. Great, thanks for explaining that. So another question came in and asked, um, can you comment on whether um, studies that review scenarios like OA plus temperature combined only versus fully orthogonal studies, whether those are still meaningful for our kind of greater understanding of how these drivers interact? Well, when I teach about experimental design, the first thing I say is that all experiments are wrong one way or another. So there is nothing that you can do that's going to be the perfect experiment. And, and the way you actually can, can answer this complex question of multiple stressors is through a strategy. So that's why I push really hard the idea that you need more than one experiment. So if you do like a, a full orthogonal experiment or you just use scenario, the level of information you can get is, is different, of course. You can understand better the potential interactions if you have like a, a pure orthogonal design with a lot of, of, of love levels. Then you can understand the performance curve on one side, the performance curve on the other one, and have some hint about how these things are interacting. But these, of course, are very heavy to, to, uh, to do because you need a lot of, of conditions, a lot of, of, of replicates. And sometimes that leads to very complex design. And the problem with that is that then you have to, to work with certain models that allow us to do that, like small things that you can keep in small volumes. It's, it's not possible to design such complex experiment with, with big things. So constraints like that makes you sometimes work with, with just two scenarios, like a present and a future with an increase in temperature and a decrease in pH. But I think the, these can tell you something, but it won't allow you to uh, resolve the mode, the type of interactions or, so that, that's, that's the limitations you have, to, but that could be a really useful approach if you want to test the model. So if you do that at the end, the beauty of, of these multi-stressor experiments that are simpler is that it's a great way of testing uh, models that are based on mechanistic understanding. So you understand your stressors, you model it, you make prediction about what's gonna happen if I do this, this and that, and then you can just have two scenarios or three scenarios within that array of changes. So it's, it's still interesting. The problem with these, these approach where you only have, let's say, two or three scenarios is that you really test a very specific set of conditions. And, and the thing is that in most places, pH is not constant, temperature is not constant, so it's not very realistic. Mm -hmm. There's going to be one, one, one spot, you know, of, of this and that. So, and then we don't know under different scenarios that might actually, you might be wrong with one of your temperature scenario and, you know, temperature and pH and what might change in a different way. So there are really strong limitations on what you can interpret. But I believe that all that is published, all this information that are out there 
a useful one way or another when you combine them. And that's the combination of approach using field work, using single stressor experiment, using model, using these multiple stressors. And it's when you combine that and using the theoretical framework that I presented a little bit today about mode of action and stuff like that, and and, 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 and these performance curve, and you expect interaction on that. And then if you have that in mind, when you reanalyze the literature, you can extract the piece of information on all these different approaches mm -hmm. and have a bigger picture. So it's there, there's no nothing wrong in doing the experiment, but you have to be really aware that it's going to be really hard to say anything about how these things interact or if they are additive or, or you know, on the mechanistic levels. Sure. So kind of in that same vein of choosing uh, a large frequency of, of different um, levels in an experiment or having a high frequency experiment, um, one participant has asked, do we know for certain yet if the future range of pH variability in coastal environments is going to shift that variability or is it going to increase the amplitude on either end? And, yeah, also and if you have a limited time. set of resources, um, where should you kind of prioritize when, when you conduct your, your high frequency um, experiment? That, that's two really excellent questions. And, and actually, I oversimplified by making this, this simple shift. <laughs> it's not, for, for modeling, you're right. I think it's going to not only shift, it's going to increase the amplitude. And that's why it's very important to monitor and to work with modelers, because they will tell you, you know, a little bit more realistic rule or how the realistically or how the pH will change in the future or temperature or oxygen or whatever you're interested in. So it's not sometimes as simple as that. I think it is just like if you don't have this information, that's a good start, I would say. If you don't have any a lot of data on the variability, the present and the future variability in the coastal zone, because in many places we just don't have this then it's a good good way of thinking that you're going to have a shift uh, of the whole variability. But you're right. I think there will. it's a little bit more complicated. So talk to your modelers uh, and check the paper. And if you don't have the resources to actually have these data, my recommendation would be if you can do some kind of monitoring, do it uh, to at least capture the daily variability because, you know, the balance between photosynthesis and respiration is really one of the main driver and then try to do it at different seasons or when you have important events happening. For example, if you have an upwelling event. So if you can't measure constantly, but you have a decent equipment to measure variability, put it in the water for 24 hours and do that every three months, for example. That mm -hmm. could be, that will give you at least a, a rough idea of the range. And that's something that is biologically relevant. If you can't do that, which in many places is the case, if you don't have any equipment, uh, what you can do is actually try to find information on a similar time of type of ecosystem. So if you work on seagrass, try to find another place, cl the closest, the, the better, of course, where they measure the, the pH variability in similar environments in another seagrass bed, or if it's corals in another coral reef, you know. And then you can also compare biogeographical region. Like if you're in the tropic, try to find information from the tropics. If you're in the polar region, something from the polar region. So there are, there are more and more data available and the GoAN website will be a really great uh, resource for this where you can actually see where are something that is as close as possible to your resource. But you can expect, for example, that you're in the tidal zone, you're going to have massive variability. If you're, if you're in a tropical region or in an open ocean, you're going to have less variability. So you, you, we, we know already a little bit, so that can orient your thinking. And, and, if, and one way of actually working well for these things is is try to avoid to have this scenario approach if you can and use range of pH like I showed for the zero chain experiment. Sure. If you, if, you, if you can do like five or six different pH, then it's great because even if you're wrong with your, 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 your prediction of the future you know, range of pH, you, you still have the information and you, can, and you can use regressions and you can basically predict anything within that range. So you can relay, re, later reinterpret your data. The data are there. And it's the interpretation that is wrong, which is fine. I think you can always rethink about what, what you have. Sure. All right. So uh, unfortunately, we're just at 11 o'clock uh, Eastern time, <laughs> 5 o'clock your time, Sam. Um, so uh, I want to thank you, Sam, 
uh, once again for presenting today. This was a really informative webinar, and um, uh, I think it was really brave of you to use Kahoot. And I think it was a hit. Um, this is something we might have to start using um, in all of our uh, in all of our webinars. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience for participating today. Um, we had over a hundred people using the the Kahoot software, so that's really exciting. Um, if you have more questions, uh, please um, join us on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange, or you could post those questions on. Uh, on Twitter and tag uh, go on and use the hashtag go on WS. And also please join us for our next go on webinar. Um, the title of this webinar will be Canada's Ocean Acidification Community of Practice. And that'll be presented by Dr. Christina Barkley. This webinar is happening on Wednesday, April 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That's UTC minus four. And you could register, register for that webinar by going to the go on website. Finally, if you're um, a scientist or an OA researcher and you're interested in uh, presenting uh, at the Go On webinar series, um, I really encourage you to sign up. You could do that by going to goon.org and uh, filling out our sign up registration form. So with that, um, thank you all very much and we'll see you next time. Thanks Bye. a lot, everybody.